Okay, welcome back. Um, this panel has a sort of um, mysterious title. Um, I say mysterious because it may be a question that is unanswerable, but the, the, the title of this panel is uh, what is the, quote, privacy interest in a public record? We all recognize the inherent tension there. And this is the point of the conference, uh, for those of you who have attended before, where we try to bring before you some people who um, will, we hope, sort of raise your, um, the, the level of your, or your thought a little bit. This is what we have sometimes referred to as our academic panel, and actually this time uh, we do have three uh, professors. And um, so these are not uh, necessarily people who are always involved in uh, the sort of frontline uh, issues that you are mainly working on in the public access and, and privacy uh, policy development area. But these are people who have done writing and teaching and thinking about these issues. And um, I think they have uh, some very interesting insights for us. I'm just going to mainly function as the umpire here. Uh, I'm going to make a very brief introductions and then turn it over to each one of them for uh, uh, roughly 15 minutes or so. Uh, we'll pause between each of them and, and see if we get some uh, dialogue going with you. Uh, and then hopefully we'll leave quite a bit of time uh, in the second half of the program to have some dialogue among the panelists and with, and with all of you. <coughs> so I'll introduce in the order that they will be appearing. First we have Professor Helen Nissenbaum. And just one moment here. Professor Nissenbaum is a professor of media, culture, and communication, as well as computer science at New York University. Her, uh, she studies the, quote, social, ethical, and political implications of computing and information technologies. Uh, and so she will be giving us some insights in those areas. Then we'll hear from Professor Peter Martin, professor and former dean at the Cornell Law School. He teaches and writes about, and I'm quoting here, the impact of technology on the functioning of law and legal institutions. Okay. It's also relevant here, I think, that Professor Martin was the co-founder of um, the Cornell Legal Information Institute, which for those of you who have had occasion to do research or did 15 years ago, have occasion to do internet research on primary sources of law, uh, you'll know that it was basically one of the first um, sources that of, law, of primary legal sources on the internet, and, and it's still a, a great re resource. I understand he's not as involved as he used to be, but I think it's a great, um, a great resource for all of us. <coughs> Peter Wynn will be our third speaker, Professor Peter Wynn. Uh, he is also an assistant U.S. attorney has been since 1997 uh, in Washington, uh, the state of Washington now. He teaches privacy law and cybercrime law at the University of Washington Law School, and he's written um, uh, some articles on privacy law, and in particular on access to uh, court records in the federal arena. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor uh, Helen Nissenbaum first. All right, um, I'm going to just talk from down here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, again, uh, I um, have a day job at the Department of Justice, and the views you're hearing are not the views of the Department of Justice. I have to say that before I open my mouth in public. Um, I'm going to be repeating a lot of the things that Peter Martin has just said, as well as Helen Nissenbaum. Um, it, just a little different perspective. Uh, the, the perspective I want to start with, everyone's been talking about architecture. Um, it's helpful for me when I think about online access to court records and the problems, is to think about the days before paper, really the days when 
Parchment was about the only way you could record things. And litigation took place in public in a very literal way. It took place in the marketplace. This is Westminster Hall. And everybody basically, uh, the three courts were there, uh, chancellery, uh, king's bench, um, common pleas, and then the merchants are there too. Everything's taking place in public because there's no other place to, to handle litigation because the community is necessary to, to make sure that the rules are being followed and the litigants are following up on, on the conclusion of the litigation. It, it's, it's impossible to have a trial in, pro, in, in secret because everything is taking place in the open. Um, now, the focus of the medieval trial was to get the dispute resolved, and to, to a very large res extent, that is still the focus of what courts do. They resolve disputes. Now, in the, in the Renaissance, when they invented printing, suddenly there was a higher literacy rate, um, and it was possible for the first time to read legal decisions, publish legal decisions, uh, have published statutes, think about the law in terms of general rules, and to keep records of what courts did. And it was also possible for the first time to have what's a secret legal proceeding. Now these were very controversial at the time. Um, and the Star Chamber has, has inherited a uh, perhaps wrongfully, a bad, a bad reputation, because when it was used by uh, Charles I to go after his political enemies, I think the political enemies went after Charles I. Um, the result of that conflict in the early modern period um, really led to the modern conception of, of law, which was the idea of law representing an agreement of private individuals which came together in the context of legislatures um, to formulate the law on the behalf of the public. Uh, the idea was the public itself, or the public sphere, is the source of the law, and that government institutions, whether they're the legislature, or the executive, or the courts, they represent the public. The public, um, the public is the principal, and the government institutions, uh, like the courts, work for the public that they're the servants, the agents of the public. And, and, and from that principle, um, it's really critical that the public have access to government information or information about the courts to allow the public to participate in their ess you know, the essence of what they do uh, and to hold their principle, hold the courts, hold the legislature, hold the executive accountable. Um, that's reflected in the political theory and the, of the time. Uh, the, the idea is that, that the public has an inherent right to monitor and be involved in the judicial process. And you can see that in the architecture of the time. Uh, this is a picture of the Old Bailey. And you see all around the, 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 the judges and the barristers and the solicitors and the parties, you see balconies where the public can watch the legal proceedings. And of course, in the modern US architecture, we see the same ideology reflected. The, the pews are there to allow the public to watch and keep track of what's going on with their government. Now, the, the reality has always been, however, that the courts have had to balance this important value of access against the need to manage information. Uh, a, lot of inform a lot of disputes involve private information, and, Peter and Peter's gone through quite a lot of it. Family law, torts, business disputes, bankruptcy, administrative law, all of these civil cases involving sensitive personal information, sensitive business information. In criminal cases, it involves not only sensitive personal information and potentially business information, but also information that affects third parties, uh, witness retaliation concerns, concerns about fair trials, concerns about protecting juries, and con concerns about making sure that juries aren't Googling defendants' criminal records. Those kinds of concerns have always been reasons why the information has been managed within the judicial system. Um, the, um, and again, I think I want to emphasize that it's not simply a privacy versus publicity balance 
There's also a concern at the point of getting to a fair trial. I mean, if a juror has access to a, de a defendant's prior criminal record, if a juror can go online and, and retrieve a motion to suppress information that was granted, um, suddenly the jury is going to know that there was a ton of coke that was seized by the per you know seized from the person's home when a, a search warrant was executed without probable cause. And I don't know if the jury is necessarily going to be particularly concerned about the uh, fairness uh, of that proceeding uh, to the defendant. Likewise. Um, Many of the rules of evidence that we have involve suppression of information and limitation of information uh, to the jury. And, and much of that information that's r removed from the province of the jury through the application of the rules of evidence uh, becomes implicated when um, all court information simply goes up online. Um, you know, of course, we were protected from much of the, the, the problem here. Uh, by the system of practical obscurity. Um, and the, the ability to have a system of practical obscurity permitted so much to happen while the document could still be public, okay? So that we could, we could, we could pervert, you know, we, as, I, as I say later, um, we can sort of have our cake and we can eat it too. We can have our publicity and eat it too. Uh, the problem, however, with, with the, what we face with practical obscurity is that practical obscurity also shields much of the information uh, that needs to be public so that the public can hold decision makers and courts accountable. And Peter Martin went through, I think, very, very helpfully, uh, pointing out that the legal standard for sealing is, is when you actually go through and do statistical uh, reviews of the, of the court files, more often than not, the courts are not applying the legal standard for sealing a document, which, which harms this public interest. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also know that, that the private interests that are protected by rules that we've established saying that you're not supposed to file social security numbers on, in the court pleadings, those too are not being followed. And so the practical obscurity of the legal system also shields uh, much of that information from public scrutiny as well. well also, the, um, there's a lot of detritus, for want of a better word. Um, judge Smith, uh, who's a magistrate judge down in, in Houston, went through the clerk's office and noticed that the Department of Justice had never bothered to file motions to unseal uh, applications for electronic surveillance. Um, and, and they just, as he said, accumulated in the clerk's office like kutsu. <laughs> um, well, that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's, that's sort of the world we were in in the, in the days of practical obscurity. Now, my focus has been primarily on PACER because that's the system I'm most familiar with, but I think many of the, the, the things I'll say will be hopefully applicable to the state courts as well. Um, you know, when we go to a system like PACER, um, we get a ton of benefits. I mean, it just makes the lives of the judges, the lives of the lawyers, and the lives of the clerks enormously um, convenient. I mean, I, 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 it's hard for me to even imagine going back to the days when you had to, um, you know, line up at the clerk's office, um, uh, you know, somebody had the file, you couldn't look at it. Um, the, the ability to just go on, file my pleadings at 11 p.m. at night, you know, from home, is just an enormous benefit, and I wouldn't want to give that up. At the same time, um, we have the sorts of concerns that, that Peter Martin um, expressed, which is how do you deal with the uh, secondary uses of the information by data aggregators? Um, there, there's an increasing reluctance on the part of businesses to use the court system because they're concerned about the disclosure of confidential and sensitive business information on the internet. Individuals are always exposed potentially to identity theft, public shame, embarrassment, and then we also have this additional problem about the administration of justice. The jurors are, are now in a potential position of um, circumventing many of the rules of, of, a, of due process that we're com comfortable with and familiar with from the days of practical obscurity, that practical obscurity in many ways permitted to, to take place. Um, and then, of course, we have, um, again, uh, the, the sort of um, who's a rat.com problem where um, the, the, the plea agreements 
are being put up online, to which are used ef effectively uh, to, to, to uh, identify snitches, uh, mostly in prison, although um, in any gang type of prosecution, uh, it, it creates an enormous problem for safety, the safety of cooperating defendants and cooperating witnesses. Um, you, if you have a snitch jacket in prison, uh, it's, it's basically a contract on your life. So, so we, we have, in the, in the case of the who's a rat dot com problem, um, you know, we're, we're, we're really in a completely different world. Um, and the world is different because the, the, the values of public access and oversight apply to a plea agreement. And yet that same information places in jeopardy the lives of cooperating defendants. This is a really difficult problem. I don't want to say that this is easy. There are three general solutions that I've often thought of. You can obviously try to get the lawyers to not file pleadings with Social Security numbers in them, to, to get the lawyers to redact what they file, to get sealing orders appropriately, follow the standard, try to avoid file, don't put the stuff in the court record if it's going to harm somebody. Um, as we know, however, from studies, the lawyers and judges um, and the studies that were done on the public um, resource.org indicated uh, both opinions as well as judicial filings by attorneys uh, failed to follow the Social Security prohibition rule. Um, we have a lot of bad habits that have remained from the days of practical obscurity. Um, and uh, we also know that agreed sealing orders are still routinely granted in violation of the standard because if the parties agree there's no dispute and judges are used to resolving disputes. We can come up with better legal rules and in the uh, Federal Judicial Conference they certainly have tried very hard to come up with and be creative in, in terms of offering options. Um, my favorite, of course, the, the rule of not filing Social Security numbers is there. They also have an, a, an additional rule in the new rule that was um, promulgated in December of last year of, of an intermediate access rule where parties on, on, for good cause, which is a lower standard than the compelling interest standard you need to seal a record, but just for good cause or a good reason, allow the parties to file a document offline. That is, it's not private, it's not public, but they can opt into a world of practical obscurity. And that's a, that's a you know, it hasn't really been explored very much, but I think that's a very interesting possibility. Um, again, we have the problem of education and the problem uh, of, of the failure to follow the rules. Um, we can come up with much better technology. Um, the, um, the rules have, in, you know, I mean, uh, this is a three ways, you know, the rules reference the technology, the technology references the rules, but the, the, the technology could be improved quite a lot. Um, and the, um, there are different ways in which um, the technology can have delayed access. We talked about the 10-day delay rule here. So there, there's opportunities in technology to have automatic redactions. There's also things technology can do. But um, we also have the problem that, um, that the, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, but we have the problem that the, um, the Congress has not appropriated any funds so that the courts can buy better technology. The state courts are always struggling to get funds to buy better technology. And we still have the problem of downstream secondary use of the data uh, not being regulated. There are switching costs that, that people have once they get a system up and running. It's very difficult to come up with a new system. So we have these three ideas. We have better technology, better rules, uh, and better training for lawyers and judges. But at some level, all three of those seem to be unable to really solve the problem. And, and what I wanted to sort of toss out for the crowd is the idea that there's a fourth component that needs to be part of the analysis, and that's uh, what we call information economics. Um, and the book of, that I read that, that gave me this idea is written by Shapiro and Varian. And, and they point out something that, that's obvious when you, when you think about it, is that information is a, is a means to communicate, but when you have it collected in large computer systems, um, it becomes a commodity. It, it becomes um, data. 
And it, it operates with very different economic rules from the way information works when it's used by individuals to communicate with each other. Um, first of all, you, you start to have positive and negative networking effects. In other words, the, the benefits are magnified, but also the detriment of information disclosure is magnified. So you're working with an exponential factor instead of a, a sort of a, a normal factor when you communicate to an individual. Um, the, the, the copy and dissemination of, of, of electronic information takes place at zero marginal cost. In other words, it costs, once you've acquired that information, it, is, it costs nothing to sell it. So no matter how much you pay for it up front, if you can get a market for somebody to sell, you can always make money. Um, you can also recombine it with other data to create something that's even more valuable. Uh, and you can, um, and, and, and because of those economics, it's actually in the interest of somebody who's in the commercial data, data selling business to, to have increased acquisition costs. The more expensive it is to obtain the information in the first interest, the better it is for the downstream sellers of the information because it protects their market. It's better for them to have the switching costs. Um, and the, the technology becomes extremely important to understand the technology and understand how it relates to the type of uses and misuses that are available is also important. So what you, what you, what you lead to is the idea of responsible information management. And this is an idea I think that, that Helen Nissenbaum really focuses in on with her idea of, um, of a principle of transmission, context relative information. Um, the idea is that the, you want to use the information and set up controls on the information, uh, controls meaning better training, better, law, better rules, um, better technology, that you want to have in mind as a goal here, the idea of increasing the positive externalities and reducing the negative externalities. You want to increase public access to core judicial records. You want to, um, you want to facilitate the review of aggregate data to, to make sure that we are we're in a position to, for want of a better word, call bullshit on people who aren't applying the rules. You want to uh, facilitate academic and empirical statistical review of how judges and lawyers are performing. And you want to um, use that information in order to feed back into the loop of making better rules, better technology, and better training. At the same time, you want to reduce the negative externalities. You want to protect business, private information, and, and law enforcement sensitive information to the extent appropriate. You want to um, oversee the commercial secondary use of aggregate information. You want to make sure that the downstream use of information is appropriate with the public interest. And you want to restrict uses of information which might threaten the administration of justice, potentially uh, organizations like uh, who's a .com. Um, the, um, To do that, you can't really do that in the context of a case-by-case decision-making process. You can't do that in the context of dispute resolutions. Um, because you're having to really look at the forest and not the trees. And judges are basically in the business of resolving disputes at the tree level, not at the forest level. You need to have an administrative approach in order to do the empirical re data review, to, to, to come up with more efficient enforcement structures, and to come up with better rules, technology, and training. Um, various things are possible at the administrative level that are not possible at the individual case level. Um, at the administrative level, you can modify the PACER site license to, to basically come up with sensible downstream restrictions on what appropriate uses of information are and not. You can uh, contractually regulate commercial data aggregators downstream, data dissemination, and, and others. Um, you can analyze data from a systemic point of view to see across the entire universe of your data um, you know, how effective are these rules to limit the filing of social security numbers, or how effective are the sealing rules being followed? And you can informally send warning letters to counsel in court to, 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 to let them know that, that, there's, um, that they're non-compliant. And you can come up with um, technological standards to, to facilitate uh, better citation formats, uh, redaction rules. You can come up with 
things at an administrative level that simply are not possible to approach from a case-by-case -case level. Um, and, and I would leave you with this, 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 this analogy. In the, in the 19th century, the way pollution was dealt with was through a nuisance lawsuit. An individual would file a, a, a nuisance lawsuit against another individual that was polluting. Um, and that worked okay in the 19th century, but in the 20th century, the common law nuisance doctrine broke apart and, and you needed uh, some form of, of agency approach in order to address the um, a situation where there simply were too many different kinds of both positive and negative externalities for those interests to be reflected in a single one-off uh, lawsuit. So I want to leave you with those ideas and, and hopefully get some feedback from you because the reality is I've been learning way, way, way more than I could ever hope to share with you from the wealth of experience in this room. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Well, we do have a little...